My name's Andrea Phillips. I work at Goldsmiths, where I run the PhD program in the art department, and I have a dubious, the dubious um, um, historical relationship to the set of material that we're going to talk about tonight, whereby I wrote a PhD um, that I ended about five years ago about walking, um, where I, I, I talked about these people um, in um, honorific terms, and I think I've probably changed my mind about 15 times since then, some of which might come out in this talk. So that's my, that's my um, professional uh, uh, capacity here tonight, that I do have a, a relationship to the material that was discussed in John Rogers' film tonight and know, know the writing of, of these guys well. I will now introduce them. Uh, John Rogers in the middle here, who was the director of the film, is the director of the film. <laughs> and um, here we have Ian Sinclair, who is a writer who I'm sure bears no, um, uh, doesn't need an introduction, and Will Self on the end there. Um, both of whom, if you didn't know them before, you will know because, of course, they were stars of the film. Um, I'm, we're going to talk a little bit um, about the film and about some of the ideas in the film for about 25 minutes now, and then open up the discussion to questions. I'm sure there are plenty of people in the audience that have uh, partial or complete knowledges of the territory that was covered today who will have interesting questions to ask or um, <coughs> comments and points to make. I'd like to start... John, by asking you uh, what motivated you to visit this territory. Um, you have a historical relationship with it, I know, um, but it, why is it important now to make a film um, that looks at one character, a character who I have to say is present in the audience, one character um, who, who exemplifies a certain relationship, uh, one might say, um, a, a romantic relationship with various uh, categories that were discussed in the film, those categories being things like uh, edgelands, um, interzones, uh, uh, and, and his own capacity, which is deep ecology. Why are those things interesting to bring to film now? Well, I think, um, I think they'd always be, I think they'd always be interesting to make a film about. I think for me personally, the, the, the point I met Nick was quite pivotal in my own development, artistic development my own practice and I think uh, I was sort of doing a sort of psychogeographical project of my own when I first met Nick but, and I was reading a lot of Ian's work and a lot of Will's work and s watching Patrick Keeler's films and John Smith's films and when I met Nick in, in one delightfully amusing man you had the embodiment of all of those things and so it just seemed you know it was irresistible I think you know as a filmmaker I think you're always you're always looking for subjects firstly and I'd, I've been looking at the idea of making a film about psychogeography for, for, a num for, for a number of years beforehand and of approaching it from quite a dry, essayistic kind of point of view, really. And, and it didn't, you know, it never really got... We, that ended up being a kind of multimedia project in High Wycombe. And, and that was really inspired by the, looking at the way that that town was being redeveloped, which is where I grew up. And then looking at the way that the uh, property developers and the planners and the local authority approached the town to redesign it and redevelop it. And, the, and it was so inhuman, the way they approached it. And psychogeography particularly offered a, an alternative way of looking at a place which sort of built in human characteristics that were absent from the traditional way of looking at a place. Uh, but, you know, turning that into a film is quite difficult to do. I think Patrick Keeler's done it brilliantly in London, uh, and it, it, it involves a critique, and that was obviously a very pivotal moment to do it at the time. I mean, I think when Down River was published about the same time, wasn't it? And around the time Lights Out came out about the same time as, as Keeler's London. And I think we're going through a similar sort of process now, particularly in London. So, you know, coming across Nick was, to almost paraphrase Russell, it was such a find. It, you couldn't, couldn't go out for a walk with Nick with a camcorder and then not make a film about him. <laughs> and what he was doing, so that's where it sort of stemmed from. So, uh, in many ways, it's a, it's a portrait of a character, obviously. Um, it, 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 it was, I found it surprisingly moving. I hate to admit the fact that I'm moved by things, but... Um, <laughs> Why is that? Well, I wonder, <laughs> you know, it's all that romantic twaddle. Yeah, but um, I, 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 it was moving because, in a way, it was, a, it, it was, it was also a portrait of, of a kind of civility, in a sense, or a servitude to uh, two other men, in a sense. There was a very interesting portrait going on here 
of the relationship between Nick and, uh, and, and Will and Ian. And the relationship um, which was at once to do with a kind of, um, some kind of internship or some um, uh, servitude going on there to your work I that really in sense that. three capacity. I don't okay. That at all, you know. I, th I think the key speech in this whole thing was the moment where um, Nick gives this great speech about he sees himself becoming Middlesex, that the landscape becomes a portrait of him, and he goes into a number of details which are very pertinent. And it is a way that, in a sense, he wants to disintegrate and cease to be an entity and become part of the thing he's been looking at. And this wasn't really to do, in a sense, with his relationship with Will, which is a real thing, which was touched on, and the fact that they share walks and that he does research. And his relationship with me, which is very, very bleak, oblique, you know, there is, there is, I mean, we, we know each other and I've, I've uh, published a piece of him, but there's no, I mean, there's no kind of feeding relationship in either direction. I, I'm stuck in one side of the town and he's in another. But what, what I thought you had here, a portrait of, was very much the raw material for a kind of poetic. And that, that in a sense, he's gathering up the materials of this epic, which he in some ways is not going to write, and that makes it ex kind of poignant, and I think you talked about emotion, and there is a poignancy, there is an abdication from the project himself, he, and he looks, and I think as Will says in the film, he looks like someone who should be in Russia, you know, he needs a deeper kind of banishment than we can offer him to come into his own. <laughs> and I thought he, the person he reminded me of, not physically or in any other way, but in the sort of nature of the spiritual quest, was the, was the poet Bill Griffiths, who died quite recently, and who, li and who li did live and emerge from exactly that part of London, mm. and who came to live in prefabs in Whitechapel and to record Hell's Angel's life and eventually to live on a narrowboat out towards Uxbridge with his entire archive, very like what Nick describes, and burn it down and lose the lot and end up in a kind of deep banishment to the north of England where he had nothing, um, as Kevin Jackson described when he wrote about him, he goes to this place and he says, it was the bleakest room I've ever seen since my worst student days. There's nothing there except this, somehow he'd, he'd salvaged a grand piano and he's kind of playing Bartok. And he's got love and hate on his, from his time in prison. He was in Brixton. The same sort of... And Bill, the difference being here, is that Bill uh, finessed from this mass of material a kind of intent poetic. He, he brought it down to a series of urban songs that then become memory devices. You hold on to the city in that way. And I thought, Nick is in the state where this material is free-floating. And the only thing for him to do is to disappear into it literally. And I think that was touching. That really was a kind of emotional thing. How many people do that, that you actually become what you are and you become the place where you are? And in this sense, it's a, it's a grand project that has nothing to do with any of the terminologies that we could apply to it in yeah. academic terms. Mm -hmm. Will, what about your relationship with this character called Nick? Well, I mean... Uh, Is there a kind of master-slave thing that goes on there? <laughs> I, don't, I think you must have taken the wrong turning and missed going into the sort of bondage club where you perhaps wanted to turn Maybe up this I evening. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I really don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I strenuously resist it. I mean, I've, I've known Nick for 23 years since we were both relatively young men. Uh, we're friends. Uh, we've collaborated on various things. But, you know, as I think John's film shows, and I completely endorse what, what Ian says, it is, uh, it's a film about the, a, a practice producing a, a highly individual and existential poetics. And, you know, Nick's thing is his thing, and he owns it completely. And I, and I, I didn't think there was any kind of... I think it defies hierarchy. I mean, I, I think, you know, to pick up on my poignant moments, because I think, you know, it, it, it is a, a film biography as well. I think that, you know, when Nick talks about how he goes to place for a nurture that he didn't find either in his family background or in the world that he's been <coughs> subjected to, I think that's very moving and, and, and very sad, very poignant. And, and that's what John's film is about. I mean, I think perhaps you're slightly distracted by the fact that, you know, maybe... Ian and I are kind of name writers who have some kind of, you know, have, have stuff. But, but as I think I said in the film, mm 
you know, in my relationship with, with Nick, to be candid, I tend to feel like the junior partner. If anybody is the servant, it's me. Because, you know, I think Ian will probably endorse this. The more you move into the mainstream, the more you're involved in the commerce of publishing and, and all that it entails, the more it, in some sense, traduces your own poetic. It's, it's an ineluctable process. It's very difficult to avoid. And it's not patronising, Nick, to say that, it, that it, there's something amazing about the way that he has sort of evaded that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he probably will publish and publish more, but I don't think he's going to... It's rare, you know, you know, to get to the source. I think there's a, there's a theory of the culture that I have, is that uh, there's a process of Xeroxing, and this has to happen something like at least four times before it becomes popular and it goes into the mainstream. So you want to kind of track back you see who's made the copy of what and what and what, and go back four or five leaps, and suddenly you, some out of the shrubbery bursts Nick <laughs> up against a wall somewhere staring at this girder that was beautifully described, yeah. and that's it. That is a kind of source. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of these people, sources, that I've come across in my own time. And I'm quite well aware, I was like, I described the genealogy of this, of this psychogeographic thing to the... Debor and the people of the 60s, and then Stuart Home, and then, you know, then, and that was too early for it to go become public in the mainstream. Then you I Xerox off from this, and it goes on, and you have a couple more, and here we are. So sort of it becomes an event at the Whitechapel Gallery. Yeah. So the interesting thing is to, to follow the stream yeah. backwards and find these original sources, and that's not often done, and so the film is a kind of important record in that sense. And I think the most orthodox aspect of it is the three talking heads who kind of bang on and uh, if, if they have a function, it's only to sort of set up the next uh, piece where the actual we're back out on the road and you're actually walking and uh, and Nick is given the opportunity to riff mm -hmm. to get towards this kind of raw poetic. Yeah. I, I wondered what would happen if actually in the trajectory of his journey he found his way down Old Charlton Road in Shepperton, you know, moving past the the sort of semi-detached house where J.G. Ballard lived, with as an intent, a kind of vision of this landscape, but finessed to a, obviously a very, very high level of practice and consciousness. Mm. And that you felt that this is pretty much where he, he's operating at that kind of intensity, but it doesn't have mm. this product at all to it. It isn't, it isn't kind of finished or finessed. There isn't that intensity about it. It's, it's, it is itself, and it can only go on flowing like, like the murky canal. Is, uh, you will mention at some point in the in the film the, the the kind of paradox of making the film. You know, I think you you refer to that at a, at a particular moment. You know, what happens when something is filmed? And uh, talking to Nick in in the alley earlier on, um, uh, we were talking about what happens when you turn the spotlight onto the edge land. And of course, and this might come back to your conceptualization of the Xerox, which is that there are a certain amount of times when the camera is turned onto the edge land, if we want to describe it as such, or the liminal space or the interzone, before it becomes constituted as something that, that is politically um, different, you know, that there's a kind of shift that occurs in that space or that place. Well, I mean, looking at this film, now, now last night in another, another place, Rich Mix up in, in Shoreditch, I was showing films that I'd made in 1969. Now, what happened was that arriving in this, this territory, which was then new to me, um, the group of people who'd, who arrived there in a communal house had, had various old battered Bolex cameras. And the way to record the journeys in the landscape was by uh, keeping a kind of constant film diary, which was completely silent, was only seen by the, the people themselves. And yet now, looking at it all this time later with the digital technology where you're able to break it up and tidy it up in various ways, it is a very much a version of what we've just seen. There are these huge epic traverses down the Lee Valley, and it takes on an enormous sort of emotional resonance because a lot of the things are not there. And just simply the way of looking with a camera has a nakedness that this film, for all its virtues, can't get at. Mm. And I think you can't go back to that, this kind of aspect whereby the moving camera is just a, a tool in your own hand that travels as you travel. It's your eye, and there's no sense of exploiting. I mean, because I'm so obscure at this point, there's no way of showing this thing to anybody. And yet, as time passes, even that yeah. becomes... And, and looking at 
um, Nick's archive and they think, oh, that's good. Just the book and the bits stuck in, you know, you can almost see it migrating into that room upstairs here where the Whitechapel boys have got their, yeah. their typescripts and their little books are in, in a display cabinet. John Rodka, number one Osborne, just around the corner, the bottom of Brick Lane, producing obscure volumes of poetry. Nobody wants to read them at the time. There they are in the glass case. I mean, I can see this arch archive actually being swallowed up mm. and creating a mythology like Rudinsky's room just Absolutely. up the road. You know, mm. Here is this room full of this bizarre material which people are invited to competitively analyze and mm. to create narratives yes, from. Yes, and we have PhD students exactly. that you know, yeah. come so along. So now if someone was, uh, if we could be all let loose into this incredible yeah. archive, well, you know, mm. you, can, well, you can see it spinning well, off. As it? already, I mean, obviously with yeah. the, the book of Dave, it's highly sophisticated. Mm. It's not a collaboration, it's Will's book, but it is, in a sense, spiritually, a kind of a, a marriage, in a sense, between these two ways of thought. And mm. it goes into a very large readership who have no sense of Nick or the archive behind it. Well, I John, do you, I was going to say, do you think about these things when you make, when you make the film? Do you think about the, the capacity of the filmmaker to uh, shed light in places that, um, you know, light, uh, you know, in the, with the ze using the uh, Ian Xerox idiom, that then become uh, something else because of that? Is that important to you? Um, it's <laughs> Do you know what, my, my first thought when answering that question and saying here tonight is, all you think about is finishing it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be honest, you know, and I think I was, I was in the edit on Monday, I was in the edit until 1am you know, <laughs> last night, so I don't think, it, it, it'll be, at that point you don't even move beyond that, it's only when you're sitting here watching it that you become aware of it as an artefact, right. and you start to become removed from it enough to be able to go, oh, right, and, and you hear laughter, and you kind of think, I said, you know, uh, uh, so it's a film about Nick, really, rather than a film about the kind exactly. of general a, conceptual theories. It's a portrait. It's almost, yeah. for me, in a way, you know, like, I can look at that as a completely detached piece of work and not feel like any involvement in it, in a peculiar, apart from rem I remember being there, because it is, Nick is so dominant within it. And, and also, for me, like, uh, the, the work of Ian and Will was so key to my thinking before meeting Nick. And that informed my friendship with Nick. And it was Russell who introduced me to Nick. And I knew about Nick. I knew the comedy character version of Nick before I knew Nick. Uh, so that made me very wary about meeting him because that character, Warren Kelp, is quite frightening. And um, uh, so, in a way, yeah, you're, Ian's completely correct in that, you know, it is just, a ver it's just another element of Nick. But uh, we want to talk about the Xerox version as well, what Ian was saying. I mean, for me, what me and Nick bonded, really, over one particular book, which is a 1925 book called The Fringe of London, which, in a way, and the thinking in that book, and also the title of the film comes from a 1931 book by James T. Bone, The London Perambulator. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you read that, and I've looked at it and thought, God, that, that could be Ian right now. You know, he talks about temporary spaces around King's Cross, the debatable landscape that exists in certain parts of the city. These are all terms which, were they to be written now, would seem highly contemporary. Uh, but, you know, the people were, had that sensibility in the sort of, like, in the 20s and 30s, and they were writing about it. And uh, that, was, that was what I saw Nick as, in a way, actually. It was a direct link that kind of, in a way, jumped through those stages of the situations. Because, I, I mean, Nick sneered. If you call Nick a psychogeographer, it's as if you've really really sort of abused him in the most coarse Anglo-Saxon, you know. Uh, so he kind of predates yeah. that. He's Edwardian, really, in his sensibilities, in that sense. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, Nick, uh, Robert McFarlane, who writes a lot about kind of edge lands and things, um, sent me this in an email. It says, there, there's a bastard countryside, somewhat ugly but bizarre, made up of two different natures which surround certain great cities. To observe the city edge is to observe an amphibian, Ends of trees, beginnings of roots, and ends of grass. End of the beaten track, beginning of the passions. That's from Victor Hugo. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, mm. this kind of, yeah, yeah. you know, follow it, follow it, follow it. Mm. When I was um, pouring through the, the, the Tate archives and found this amazing group of photographs of a window <laughs> cleaner's funeral in Bethnal Green, and I started to research this uh, artist who'd done this stuff in the 1950s, I discovered a, a journal exactly like what we saw of Nick's describing a, a bicycle trip down the northern sewage outfall to Beckton, which I thought was, I mean, I felt it was 
kind of personal discovery when I stumbled on this highway in the 1960s and it was wild and overgrown and Beckton was a wilderness. And you realize in 1953, someone's already hacking his way down there. Um, and in the same sense as Nick, making it feel like a kind of mirror of his own mistakes, his own sense of loss of identity and, and looking for a landscape that corresponds with what's lacking. And, and these edge lands seem to offer that because they, don't, they, they have different kinds of resistance and they have different kind of poetic about them. Mm. And, and that's what's exciting, that you, you're sort of escaping from that density of the city. Mm. And that, to me, is what's disturbing about now the current developments <coughs> and enclosures with the whole Olympic process in the lower Lee Valley is that these pieces that, that allow you to, to lose yourself and find separate identities are being taken away and, and given an over-dominant narrative which is explained to you in, in highly sophisticated computer-generated <coughs> forms, which is why it's important to stick with these kind of almost documented, <coughs> casually documented realities of somebody walking and you're just more or less grabbing them. It's not a sort of uh, the tracks are not laid. This is not a high budget movie, this is, this is catching yeah. places that could be swallowed up and that disappear. Will, what's your relationship? At one point you say in the film that you, you feel that your work is far more linear, if I remember rightly, sorry I might be misquoting you, and I wondered whether, what definition you're making there between your, your approach to this kind of territory and maybe <coughs> the one that's just been described. Well, um yeah, I mean, I think that, that uh, Nick and, and, I mean, Ian does traverses and does linear walks. And, uh, and of course, his Hackney book, recent Hackney book, is a bit of an exception in that he was kept out of Hackney. But there is a circumambulatory quality to it. And uh, Nick is involved, as he says, and it is the, the core of it, in trying to completely absorb himself with, he's almost stripping away the human geography to get at the kind of bones of the place. And it, 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 he's, he's like a, an archaeologist sorting through a living midden and kind of looking at these, these layers and, and absorbing them psychically in order to pair it right back to the bedrock, ultimately, or certainly to the, to the actual physical topography rather than the human geography laying on top of it. But, the sort of thing I tend to do, and I have to say, I, I think I've given it up now, actually, because <laughs> I was defeated by, actually, I walked from J.G. Ballard's house in uh, Shepparton to Heathrow a couple of weeks ago and then flew to Dubai and walked to the highest building in the world still under construction, the Burj Dubai, this ludicrous dick that these <laughs> people have planted in the desert. Uh, as a kind of homage to Ballard as he was dying. And um, I, it fucking did for me, frankly. I'm not going to be doing that again. <laughs> um, but it, for the last few years, I've been doing these jump cut walks yeah. where I walk to airports and then fly. Because I believe that, that the kind of it's united in my physicality for me in that way. It's sort of the way that I apprehend territory is, is through the body. And I think that the kind of... Jet travel is such a recent innovation that the kind of, you know, the, the limbic system can't take it on board, really. You, if you walk to the airport, fly, and then walk from the airport at the other end, you just think you've jumped cut like a movie. You sort of think, you think that kind of Hounslow is rammed into the Trucial coast to create a con continuous land mass. So that... But that sort of thing, and I think I said it in the film, that sort of thing I think Nick regards as, as slightly rather gauche, actually, and sort of a little kind of outre and sort of bits of cheesy almost, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure I don't agree with him in a way. But <laughs> is, it, is it cheesy? Or, um, who talks at some point? I think it was you were that talked about how, you know, that he's actually maybe he needs to be let loose from London and go to Poland or whatever. I'm wondering whether. Here and I, I feel perhaps that I'm going to get you know shot down for saying this in present company, but maybe there's a, there's a demonstration of the limits of London that's going on in this film in some way as well. No, I, I was thinking I don't also think so, as no. I was watching him that I, I've just spent quite a lot of time in the very north of Norway and thinking about 
and, and the very north, of, in the Barents region, in the very north of Europe, and thinking, which is a special economic zone constructed along the same lines as Dubai, and thinking about that kind of landscape and wondering whether the, the, the borderland or the edge land is, is entirely different there. I mean, of course, there are similarities. There are the same materials, the same concrete, the same, you know, but I, I'm wondering whether, whether there's a limit to London. No, that you were trying to express in, in your jump cutting, in a way. No, no, I don't think it is that. I think it's a different practice. And what oh. I'm concerned with is subverting what I call the man-machine matrix. I think sort of storming airports, walking onto planes, fighting people to walk through the foot tunnel at Heathrow, all of that sort of stuff is, is for me, it's agitprop for me. I mean, I really think it sucks dog shit through a straw, the way mm. people... Uh, you know, and I, I'm actually, I, I'm not a pacific and calm person, and I actually kind of hate the car society quite fanatically. I don't have, for example, Ballard's marvellous kind of Manichaean uh, philosophic view of it. I rather wish I did, but I don't. But I think that Nick is, I don't, I think he wants to walk across Russia. He may well walk across Russia, but what's more likely is that he will not Get, get in any form of wheeled transport at all and uh, will just walk mm -hmm. for a long period of time because his, his objective, as he says, is to fully absorb himself into his locale. That is the deep topography. Mm -hmm. And there are no limits because if you think that Nick has millennia of time at his disposal, he may only have a limited space, but he has all of time in that way. And I think that's what John's film really brought across very strongly for me, was that he's, Nick is walking in time as much as he is in space. Mm -hmm. mm, that is a very important point. You seem to always wash up against this same pumping station. Yes. Place, <laughs> <laughs> wherever he in went. In Mogden. Now, I felt that yeah. you, you know, is, does London have limits? Well, it, yeah. it did have limits that used to be lunatic asylums. They were the kind of the satellite ring of asylums or what are out there, because you you disperse madness into these places. And I, when I was listening to Nick and the kind of particulars of how he looked at, at plants and, and the kind of morphing life forms out there, I, I really did think about John Clare. It was, it was the same kind of notion of the particulars of his own landscape. And the, the advantage for John Clare is that when he actually decides to walk out of the asylum in Epping Forest, you know, there is somewhere to go <laughs> beyond London. There is this journey, there is this escape. It's illusory because the person he's thinking about as his inspiration is dead, and when he gets back, the <coughs> wife who uh, uh, welcomes him just puts him into another asylum further out in Northampton. But for, for, for Nick, I felt there, there is no kind of welcoming asylum. There is no journey. There is no... He, he has to circle the same ground over and over and over and come back to this place and kind of beat his head against the bars and... Uh, Try and make the you know absorb the he's a great description of the molecules quivering yes. and the whole thing shivering with his the gaze of his attention and it's not going to mm -hmm. you know you know this is a a, a fated enterprise and, well, and so, I think so. <laughs> yeah I think so no I, I don't think I think that's because surely one one imposes upon it at some level uh, one buys into mass consumerist society, sort of ineluctably. You know, I think that, that Nick's poetic may well work. Literally. Yeah, mm. it, I think it may work. And I think that's what, again, the film, I, I mean, maybe that's just because I'm a, a hopeless, I'm a, an anti-romantic romantic. And I, I think it, it will work in some Maybe it's way. already working. I mean, maybe it's working for something. me. I mean, just I've wrote the tape round in the camera. Yeah. yeah. It's working. I, I'm not so sure that it, it won't necessarily work. Well, um, I, I was struck throughout it uh, um, of the way in which Nick describes landscape as being very similar to the way in which contemporary artists would describe the way they work with an object, actually. So I think there's all sorts of things that, um, you know, I think there's something very curatorial going on here as well. You know? So I'm, but I'm, you know, maybe there's a, a shared curatorial nature between all four of you that unites you in some kind of strange pact. I, I has it, I'm going to ask one last question then open it up and I'm going to ask this question and then quickly ask for, 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 for responses from you guys as well. But talking of dicks and Dubai, I did wonder where the women were in this film, John. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, guess, I guess that's a question that is um, not only about the film but kind of about the territory too. Yeah. 
And, and I guess it's, a, it's an old question as well. It's not, mm. I'm not the first person to point this out. As my wife will testify, actually, I'm always very keen to counter those sort of feminist critiques of things, but this is one where you can't really. I think it is. A, <laughs> it is yeah. That's all right then, let's yeah. move on. <laughs> it is a very male territory, and you look at it and you kind of go, because I did a, a sort of psychogeographical project with my sister, who is here this evening, I should be careful, but uh, I did all the bloody walking, you know, oh, and, and, she, and, and she made it look nice. And it's, but it's interesting, it is a very male way to engage with the landscape. Maybe that has to do with the obvious reasons that people talked about because of, we live in a violent, patriarchal society and it's not etc. And those things are all very true. Uh, so, uh, no, I'll leave that to people who are better informed on that to <laughs> get stuck into it and have more of an axe to grind in that area. Boys, anything to say? Yeah, I've, I've had heard that question once or twice before. I wonder, I wonder. Uh, and I was <laughs> saying, all I can say is that within recent times anyway, most, most of the people who've approached me that want actually to, to go off on expeditions and walks or are doing things uh, of their own are, have been women, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, and one of, the, one of them being a kind of great granddaughter or whatever of De Quincey, which was very exciting when that happened. It was you know, wonderful. And she had this... De Quincey lady had the perfect response to this landscape when we were wandering through all this. So, you know, the others were all snapping away and she did nothing and nothing and nothing. And then as we went over some particularly toxic creek near the Lee, she produced from this, this pataphysical book which had a picture, wonderful kind of uh, engraving of an old river which had an explanation inside that was totally fantastic. It was nothing to do with the actual image. Mm. And she just said, take a photograph of me with this. And I did, you know, and I realized that in a sense, this was a, a metaphor that was very, very useful to me and, and how I look at things that, you know, in a sense, is what, what Will, Will has done is that you, you make your own islands out of this. And, and I think it's kind of a, there's a feminine sensibility there, mm. if I can say so, yeah. which was, right. is less kind of crazy men cr crashing across miles and miles and miles and kind of, being pleased with themselves just for the sheer distance and the hardship, you know. Let's get to, let's walk to the airport. Let's uh, crawl on our hands and knees up a, t you know, whatever, whatever. You know, we've got to make it worse yeah. and worse and worse for ourselves to justify the psychosis. Mm. I don't think <laughs> we, well. we, women have to do that. I think they, they do more interesting yeah, things. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the weirdest thing, I, mean, I, I walked straight into the desert, and all the way I was thinking, what the fuck are you doing this for? You're a crazed, <laughs> patriarchal, psychotic masochist who's just sort of involved in some self-flagellation here. You know, in fact, why don't you just check into one of these hotels and <laughs> chill out? I mean, what's it all about? <laughs> um, but... Uh, um, but, you know, you do get very, very strange epiphanies. When I got out of the desert, I actually had heat stroke. So I, I got into Ballard's Vermilion Sands. I mean, it just went bright red, everything. So that was worth it, in a weird way. <laughs> um, there are many, there are women uh, who, who walk. You're one of them. <laughs> and, you know, it's Rebecca Solnitz, it's, it's of history course. of walking. Yes, uh, yes, yes. You know, um, I don't think that... The, I think John's made the obvious and the right points uh, about, you know, the, the perceived level of threat for the solo walker, which I think is, is important and, and not to be I mean, downgraded. No. Uh, there are lots. I mean, uh, mo one of the most extreme uh, people I've met in the whole area was, was a woman who walks those edge lands constantly, and she only... I mean, I was... Again, I was... When I went with her, I was recording everything, and she didn't touch the camera. She's only interested in the confrontation with security. Mm -hmm. So that she knows in all of these places there comes a point where you're looking into some forbidden building and the people come out, and then she's interested and she makes her up. She's albums and albums of the way that you have these engagements with these freakish figures who emerge. That's all she's interested in. And it's much tougher than, than what I would do out there. Yeah. And she carries kind of false identities and tells different mm -hmm. stories, and, and this is it. And, and that's her practice. And you know, I think so. This is interesting. And people like Emily Richardson make very interesting films of this sort of area and activity, but in a different way. So, I, you know, I think... Anyway, it's, it's I think we can I go thought, beyond you know, that particular absolutely. line of attack. And maybe we have to develop a more complex <laughs> argument around yeah. it, though. Maybe I do. Um, so let's open it up to, to comments or questions from the floor. Do we need to... Do we need to wait for a microphone? Yes, can you wait for a microphone if you've got something to say? And maybe you want to shove your hand up in the air so we know. 
if anybody's got a question. Yes, thank you very much. If you could just wait until the microphone arrives. Thank well, well, you. I was, well, I was just uh, aware of, uh, when you mentioned um, Nick was sort of compared to a, a Russian traveller. I was thinking of sort of writers of like Klebnikov who were travellers around the Caucasus in, in, in just after the revolution. And uh, actually, he, he was a walker. He died of starvation, actually, but he was a, a poet and uh, a kind of temporal geographer who would map out um, kind of... He was trying to find some kind of formula that would... Uh, his, uh, of re historically recurring uh, moments, you know, sort of thing. And he, he, he kind of indexed uh, the whole of kind of Russia in, in terms of these uh, temporal lines. I, I was just wondering if you had any kind of comments about that in terms of sort of uh, a geography in time. I think you, you, you mentioned, I think it was Will mentioned it briefly. So I just wondered if you had any comments, I mean, especially in relation to a kind of Russian travel. I mean, in, in terms of it, you know, the liminality of, uh, of London space, I thought the spread across a larger space was something that, that I mean, the, the liminality of, uh, of London seems to constantly grow or change. I mean, I, I used to I live in Beaufort 25 years now, and uh, I thought it was the edge of the city when I first moved there, and now it's full of uh, the <laughs> middle-class kind of bourgeois filmmakers and stuff. So I'm just wondering what, what, what's going on there, you know, sort of talking about temporality. Half of them seem to be here this evening. Yeah, yeah. marvellous. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't think Bo was an edge land even when you moved here. I mean, my... <laughs> My wife's, uh, you know, older relatives who are out in sort of Brentford, well, they were, they were farmers in the 1920s and 30s, and they've stayed absolutely stock still, and the city has come out and built on their farmland. They're still sitting there with these kind of deep rural Essex accents mm. in London now. They, they didn't go anywhere, so I'm not, I'm not sure... <laughs> on what you said about Klemnikov, and presumably you saw the the Kiefer show that was on, who kind of made use of this, and I, I think not too badly in a way, and I like the kind of rich impasto of those canvases, which are kind of like bits of earth, but don't you think there's a relationship between him and all circular historians, between Vico and Spengler, and that it, it is, you know, all those ideas, and I, and I see that in Nick's practice as well. It, it is, it is a, a, a willing, if you like, of the eternal recurrence, whether it's of social and political forms or of the landscape itself. Uh, I, I suppose that's how I read it. But if we continue this point a little bit around um, the, coming back to the concept of deep topography, then is there a, a kind of um, a desire to keep on mining whereby geography is, is replaced by space and time, so to allow that. I mean, certainly that, that has happened academically within the bounds of geography. So beyond the, beyond the moment where geography, geographers in academia grasp psychogeography, and I'm sure you know about this very well as a kind of hot topic mm. um, of, of research, that beyond that, so now those same geographers are like the panel tonight, becoming bored with the concept of psychogeography, having 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 proved that um, geography can be Debordian, which on one level would seem to be uh, contradictory in terms, that coming out to the other side and defining geography in spatial and temporal terms, I mean, there's a kind of repetition that goes on here, is there? Well, I find great advantages in being totally incompetent. You know, I was, I was a very useless geographer. I kind of <laughs> bluffed my way through what I had to do in geography and, and never was entirely comfortable with the sort of technical vocabulary. Um, and the same thing, um, being a <laughs> botched architect, having, having a very rough sense, was actually an advantage in suddenly being confronted with Hawksmoor churches when I was working as a gardener, and, and this allows you to write, in a, you know, because that's the kind of bottom line, is mm. that, for me anyway, is that this uh, Faustian contract to produce this stuff, this kind of writing, and all of the rest of it is just uh, window dressing. So to be free to write without having any form of real expertise or, or knowledge allows you to attack from all directions at once and end up with some kind of mm. idiot's knowledge that, that seems quite exciting because you don't have to footnote, you don't have to be correct, you can make mistakes and this achieves something. 
question. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. So, you know, when we come to the point of academically describing where it all comes from and what the structures are, then I think it begins to become something else. Those mm. things in themselves are interesting. Mm. I mean, you know, yeah. the, the essays on are themselves another form rather than the, the thing they're discussing has been mm. blasted into a pile of dust. It's gone. It's part of this kind of mm. midden that, that is out there in one of these secret rooms. Yeah. Will, what about you in terms of deep topography? What's your understanding of its use as a term? Well, I think that the, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think in Nick's formulation, it is, it is a, a mystical thing, really, fundamentally. I think it yeah. is, I think he's a mystic. Um, and he's a poet like Ian. I'm, I'm not a poet. I mean, I'm a, fundamentally a, a, a narrative writer. So, you know, however far I deviate from it, my interest in walking, I mean, I think Ian says it in the film, it, 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 it provides you with a narrative line. Uh, and you can't avoid that. But I also construct narrative lines without needing to walk. So it's mm. not, it's just one of the things that I might do for narrative. And, and if you talk about kind of geography and, and, you know, whether geography can kind of assimilate time in that way as a dimension, as it's, started to assimilate the psyche or the, the relationship between human and physical geography. Well, I mean, I dare say it can. I mean, the, the, you know, of the making of many books, there is no fucking end, and most people don't read them. I mean, That's if you, there's a very, very good essay called So Many Books, I sent to Ian, actually, on this, <laughs> this subject of the kind of uh, ludicrous proliferation of unread PhD theses. So obviously this is a rich... Yep. Uh, field for it's them to get vein. going in. One of the, one of the <laughs> aspects, looking, looking, kind of being very ancient, and I was talking about looking back at archives of 60s stuff, and I was looking at uh, the, the documentary material I was shooting in the Roundhouse in 1967 with Allen Ginsberg and all those people at the Dialectics of Liberation. Not one of them at any point mentioned psychogeography, mm. but there was another terminology that was being thrown about all the time, which was psychopolitics which is unheard of now. Mm. What it was, I'm not sure, but it was... <laughs> well, it, was it kind starts of it. here. The reinvention of psychopolitics so, I mean, just, starts just, here. Just pull back. I, I'm not... Um, I'm less uncomfortable with the Debordian view of what psychogeography is than perhaps Ian or maybe yeah. Nick is. I mean, I still... I think the big crisis for Debord was that, that he... You know, he came to believe his own myth, which is very. Ha that's perhaps that's what psychopolitics is. Actually, it's Debord's life and death. Uh, I, I'm not. Uh, you know, I I th I, th I think that, that there is plenty of room still for the for the derive to to attack the society of the spectacle. Uh, mm. I, I I don't think that that is over in, in many ways. I think, I, I think Ian still believes in it, really, and I think his, his recent work in relation to the Olympics, which is yeah. the most egregious example of this, that you could, you know, it's the, it's the literal mounding mm. of capital into a sort of hideous, fatted calf, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that's going on at the moment. I, I think, you know, the... the the, there's, there's still, you know, I, I would still urge everybody here tonight to, to leave and, and walk uh, across the city in it, in it, in it, so as to, to tear, tear, tear that down. I don't think that's over. I'm mm. interested in, in um, mystical correspondences. Because Debord, you know, this, this talking, I uh, was very surprised reading a piece in the LRB that, in fact, in one of his pieces, he, he quotes from Orson Welles' film, Mr. Arcadin, or A Confidential Report. Well, um, I used this title, Confidential Report, as the subtitle of the book I just done, Hackney, Rose Red Empire, and have a whole riff on Welles and the fact that when he turned up in Hackney at the Empire and he, uh, he's rehearsing Moby Dick and he goes out the back and interviews these old ladies in their arms houses. At the same time, he was writing a version of, of Mr. Arcadin or a confidential report, which was in a completely obscure film in his genre. You know, nobody had heard of it. But yet, somehow, Debord has picked up on this and quotes an anecdote 
from this film and you know, I think uses it in a film of his own, a strange narrative that Wells does about um, a scorpion being given a ride across a river on a frog's back and you know, all of this stuff that Wells yeah. does it, the shtick about. And here, here it is, and I, you know, I, could, I can't imagine how those two things yeah. fuse and connect uh, in a way that I thought I was making a big leap in getting into this Mr. Arcadian film and using it because it's about a, an unreliable way of dealing with the myth of history and how you research your own past and as the witnesses appear you kill them so you eliminate your own story. And, it, and the whole film is like a career suicide note which also was what writing about Hackney was always described as. Roland Camberton says, you know, if you want Until to now. kill a career, write about <laughs> Hackney. And he, he writes his Hackney book and never, never writes another one. And yeah. his final book, I discover when his daughter emerges from the ether, is that he, he had written this huge book about a series of journeys on foot around the whole of Britain. And he walks across Europe to the Middle East, uh, you know, in, the, in about 1954 or 5, mm -hmm. and produces this book, which disappears. So... Yeah. This is my system of mystical correspondences yes. that go in parallel with the Xeroxes. Mm. You understand those two principles, that's a very you've got it all. <laughs> yeah. Okay, on that note, you find a meeting moment. That's it. Yes, another question oh, back sorry. there. No, okay, can't sorry. escape yet. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> uh, just congratulate John on the film. I thought it was really good as well, I'm sure everybody did. But I'm um, just wondering, just a comment really, the kind of expedition, the beginning of any expedition, such as the ones that we've been talking about, you're kind of mapping, mapping the every day. I was just wondering whether you thought the film is perhaps then placing kind of an iconic kind of importance on each of these spaces that is not actually something that the space is about. Therefore, should you document, write about, or film this kind of expedition in the first place? Yeah, it's a good question, actually. I mean, that's, I mean Nick... Uh, says something along those lines in the film, doesn't he, about there is a danger when you do this about taking the overlooked and turning it into something he's gazed at and shouldn't be. But I think these places are so far away from being celebrated and being held up as iconic that I don't think this film would suddenly elevate them to the status of the London Eye. You know, Mogden is not going to be uh, on a tourist trail, you know. Well, well who knows, you know. And, <laughs> and, I, and I do think... Uh, I mean, in some ways, I think places like those suburban streets around Finchley, I mean, an Arnos Grove, that's where most people live, you know, and they're so maligned and they're so sort of sneered at. You know, I was, I was reading a column in the New Statesman today with Nicholas Lezard, and he sort of talked about how his cash point card was stolen and somebody had used it in. Leytonstone and Walthamstow, where I live, Leytonstone. And, uh, <laughs> said, and, you know, I said to them, I would never be seen dead in such places, you know, and I thought, well, Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, uh, but, uh, it's a very good cemetery, though. It's a very good cemetery, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so I don't yeah, think, right. I think there's a lot of work to be done before we go, but I think those places need to be celebrated. I think we need to challenge these traditional ideas of heritage because they're misplaced. You know, this lazy, you know, in any town, they'll sort of go, oh, look at this building, it's Georgia. But most people who live in those places never have any engagement with those buildings, whereas they do have an engagement with some sort of piss stench bus stop on the A40, which has so much narrative in it and so much heritage within its framework that we should celebrate them more, I think. So do, do we think that um, the character that is Nick is actually engaged in a kind of detournement towards celebration? I mean, is that what's going on here? So to pick I, up your turn. I think, I think, I think, oh. I think um, <laughs> Nick would... Nick used to sort of... When I talked like this to Nick, he, he would kind of chastise me but kind of comment upon my civic mindedness yeah, I think Nick is <laughs> I think Nick is quite right yeah. <laughs> I think were you surprised that he was willing to un undertake this process of actually doing this I mean, he wasn't willing to appear on the stage and talk about it yeah no he's very willing I mean if you turn a camera on he's in front of it talking I mean when I, when I came to cut the film you know because uh, you know, really my, my original ambition was to make a before I met Nick my, my original ambition was to make a landscape film you know uh, and, uh, and I started shooting the film with Nick, and I thought, well, you know, this, this, is, this could be that landscape film, but with people in it. And it's, not, it's not. I mean, you know, you, you mentioned Patrick Keeler. Yeah, And exactly. Patrick Keeler does your kind of look at life, steady stare at some of the zones that appear in this film, but then exactly. the, by the time it gets... 
finessed into Paul Schofield. There's a very <laughs> yeah. remote and elegant and ironic pit, which this is the absolute opposite of. Well, you can't you replace chucked that. Chucked both into the mixer at the same time. Well, you, Ian, when I sent you that rough footage years ago, you, you, <laughs> you flattered it by calling it grunge keeler, which I thought was, was an apt description. So <laughs> when it came to cutting this, you know, deliberately shaky bits of footage were inserted to keep that grungy element to, to, to it. But there's hardly any, there's hardly any sort of locked off landscape shops. Because Nick jumps in front of the camera and riffs, mm. you know, so I'd have had to have gone out without a camera to, to get those landscapes. Without Nick. Yeah. <laughs> Which is impossible, because the idea of going to Arnos Grove without Nick, is Arnos Grove there if Nick isn't with you? I mean, <laughs> what is at the end of the Piccadilly line if you're not with Nick? You know, if you haven't walked there for a start, and I couldn't walk there without Nick, Oh. And what would be there, you know? OK, I'm, I'm just going to um, stop that riff because um, we're running out of time. And so I just wonder whether there was one more question um, to end the session. Any one more, se one more question? Stroked on the lot of you. Ah, yeah. <laughs> They're better now. <laughs> one more question. Oh, there's two. Let's take them both and then we'll see if we'll... No, no, that's much too experimental. Let's see if we can... <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, too psychopolitical. Fletcher, and a lot of people know his film, but I think I got them out of college library and they don't seem to have been taken out by anybody for about 15 years, which either means they're rubbish or just overlooked, and I just wondered if any of you guys were influenced by Fletcher. Okay, let's just hold that and then ask the other question and see if by some weird merge we can answer them both together. Um, I'd like to ask about uh, fragments uh, and about... Um, Depth, um, because in your uh, in the films, it, it, well, Will said about how the uh, Nick was um, greater than the sum of his parts, and I, I wondered because uh, my exploration of similar places is um, I'm often absorbed by the fragments and the bits of history and the the weeds and the you know the, the, the things that are put together, and I wondered whether that was a fascination that you felt as, that you had with with these spaces. Okay, so I don't know whether you are going, to, but I'm sure you you are going to be able to bring together Fletcher and fragments. fragments and Fletcher. Yeah, isn't it? fragments of Fletcher Fletchments. have influenced me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Fletcher, as you probably know, you know, he he one of one of the aspects of him was that he was very engaged with the Wapping Limehouse sections of the Thames. He also did Spitalfields, but then he did other parts of London. So I kind of cut out of the other parts of London and really, really zoomed in on his drawings of Limehouse Church or whatever, and uh, respected him as somebody who clearly had gone in into the territory and was able not only to do the, the drawings which he did, as, as also to kind of pr provide a text. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I mean, recognize him as a kind of, in any way, an ancestor of my practice, mm -hmm. because they seemed, seemed to slightly carry inverted commas around them. They fitted in a particular way that they could be produced as books that were uh, very attractive and in their time very popular. Yeah. And the whole way they were absorbed into the film, where you've got James Mason taking on the sort of Patrick Keelery, Paul Schofield bit rather strangely, gives them a flavour that they don't have, I think, in the original. And mm -hmm. I, th I think he is definitely a, you know, a figure to be, to be recognised. And I mean, where, where I live, near where I live, he, he was one of the first people I saw who wrote up Albion Square in Hackney and, and uh, really drew it when it was sort of a place that was unnoticed and, and passed through and surrounded by bleakness on all sides. So he was a guy who, who got around, you know, this is, this is what you feel. He did what, he was another of these wanderers of the city. Mm -hmm. So there's the Fletcher. And he did work on a principle of fragments. <laughs> <laughs> Uncannily. <laughs> He sort of plugs that gap. I mean, for me as well with Fletcher, I, sort of, I came to the books before the film and I found the film a bit dis disappointing really, in a way. But uh, with those topographical writers that I was talking about earlier on, there's a lot of that stuff around the sort of 20s and 30s through the 40s. There's a, there's a really interesting strain of it after the war, mapping out kind of post-war Britain and the, and the sort of topographical changes going on there. And there seemed, there seemed to be a bit of a gap in that writing really, sort of in the 60s and 70s. And so Fletcher kind of in a way is for me sort of like where he's the person that plugs that gap and you know my interest in him as well was because I used to walk around Islington a lot and which is a sort of I always felt was quite a misunderstood misclassified part of London because it is sort of, sort of quite proletarian and quite gritty you know it's not kind of like the Laterati and the Blairites and all that lot 
And, and Fletcher was writing about that in the, in the 60s, and that is one of the bits in the film, Chapel well, Market. I mean, aspects, you know. I guess, of him going to Peter Ackroyd, that you know, yeah, there is a right. sort of, what they're looking for, a return of verities or places where time is sort of uh, in a vortice in a certain place. This, this kind of aspect of him goes in there, where you know, you, there is a, a magic about turning into a particular courtyard or whatever, and yeah. this is it. And there's a, there's a sort of privileged and slightly conservative point of view as well, I think. Mm. Some, there's certain moments in the film where Nick mimics that. There's those fantastic moments where he turns suddenly in, to look at something as if it's a courtyard. Mm. And you know, of course, because we never see what it is. I don't mm. think we rarely, except when he tells us to look where the river was. So we don't quite know what he's looking at. But we can be pretty sure it's not a beautiful courtyard, mm. a la Fletcher. It's probably, well, I, I don't know, a kind of um, pebble dash wall or something. I mean, something that's not... Mm. That, that's not an elegiac fragment at all in that respect, but maybe something that's um, really not worth looking at at all. Mm. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> Will, fragments, Fletcher? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I just, uh, you know, I think um, I d it's not bogus. I mean, you... I mean, I know you're just um, being a little flip, but, I mean, Nick really does believe these things are beautiful. I mean, he believes they're just as beautiful as Fletcher believes the beautiful kind of old Tudor courtyard that might still have been left in mm. was beautiful. He does believe that they're elegiac mm. places, and he does believe that it's only by, you know, accepting the revolution of everyday life in that way that anybody is freed and you know though he disavows the term psychogeography he's certainly close to the original de Bordian idea in, in that way he thinks that there's something I mean I think for him it's a spiritual revolution it's not a political one but he thinks that and believes that in finding these things beautiful he's really helping you know yeah. himself and the commonality I but think that becomes that, that's very yeah. clear in the film. Yeah, yeah it's not a shtick, you know, mm -hmm. to use a term from the vanished language of these parts. Yeah, that, have, that, was, that was a concern when starting out in the film. If it was shtick, it would dry up. Yeah. It's not, shtick. you know, and it's not, and it clearly isn't. It's clearly Nick something which is integral to Nick, and you know that's that's what it's like walking with Nick without a camera. You know, I did a, I did a, you know, a forty mile with Nick once in. 37 degrees of heat, you know, around High Wycombe. And uh, the, the, Nick riffed like that the whole way, you know, and would have carried on, and all the way back home as well into London. So it's very, it's authentic, you know, and it's yeah. very deep. Mm. Great. Thank you very much. Well, congratulations on a fantastic no, film you. that has clearly set our minds going <laughs> and our feet walking, possibly, <laughs> and other cliches to end talks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.